Welcome to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast with Sakar Kali. During this program, you will hear guest experts sharing their experiences, best practices, and market insights. We discuss investing in multifamily apartment complexes and how a busy professional can passively invest hassle-free in various opportunities. Your host, Sakar Kali, owns millions of dollars of assets and has done thousands of value-add projects over 20 years now. So listen in for insights. Here's your host, Sakar Kali. Welcome to another edition of Premium Cashflow Podcast. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Scott Lewis. Uh, he is the co-founder and uh, chief uh, executive officer with Spartan Investment uh, Group. Welcome uh, to the show, Scott. I appreciate you taking time today. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Awesome. Uh, Scott is with uh, Spartan Investment Group, SIG, as we call it. Uh, he is the co-founder and chief executive officer. Uh, from his projects, uh, you know, doing in DC and condo conversions. Now they are a big name in the self storage and RV uh, uh, parks industry. Uh, to date, SIG operates uh, well over 4,000 uh, self storage units, 200 RV pads, and have completed 11 million in development projects as well, and have a $97 million more runway into them. And they have collectively raised well over $25 million in uh, equity as well. Uh, Scott is responsible for developing business strategies and plans ensuring their alignment with short-term and long-term objectives. Uh, in addition to uh, Spartan, Scott is also in the U.S. Army Reserves and is an Operation Iraqi Freedom Veteran. So thank you for your service, Scott. I appreciate it. Um, Scott graduated from Michigan State University with degrees in chemistry and marketing from Catholic uh, University with MS in management and from Georgetown University with a certificate in project management as well. So you bring in an incredible experience, uh, Scott. Uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, uh, to this show and I've been trying to, you know, uh, sort of looking forward to, uh, to this conversation as well. Uh, give our listeners, Scott, uh, some background about how you got started and how you kind of came about in a big way in the self-storage uh, uh, arena. Well, I'll, I'll take the listeners back to kind of my high school and college days. And you know, one of my, my first jobs and favorite jobs was that of a framer for residential construction. Nice. That's how I earned money in high school, and that's how I earned money in college. Mm -hmm. And I always like the built environment. Um, you know, being a framer, um, I'm detail oriented in the in the aspects of planning, but I'm not. As far as like being a finished carpenter, that's not me. I like the rough stuff. I like getting out there with a hole in the ground, and six days later, there's a framed in shell with with a sheeted roof and and hung doors and everything. Sure, sure. That was always really like fun to me to get out there because it, mm. it was fast. It was, you got to like, sure, uh, sure. you know, move through and, and move on to the next thing. And that's kind of when my, 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 I guess, affinity for the built environment started. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to school for it. Um, and then my, but I, I did in 2005 buy a condo in Chicago, mm -hmm. not a fantastic idea. Um, <laughs> So um, I joined the army in 2006. So I lived in the condo for about a year. Uh, I think everybody on everybody that's listening is pretty aware of what happened in 2007, 2008. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, I still own that condo. Uh -huh. um, it is worth four thousand dollars more today than it was 15 years ago when I bought it. So hashtag <laughs> that was dumb. Sure. Um, but I've had a fantastic tenant in there the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, she's been in there for 13 of those 15 years. Kind of have an unwritten rule. I don't raise your rent. You don't have a lease. You don't call me. The rent shows up by you know, the seventh of the month, whatever. Um, <laughs> that's kind of our unwritten kind of rule. Sure. She's been mm -hmm. a fantastic tenant. But that's kind of my my intro to being an accidental landlord because I joined mm -hmm. the army um, and left Chicago and I still had that thing. So I had to do mm -hmm. something with it. So mm -hmm. I rented it out and you no, know, it's been an okay. It's been you know relatively uh, painless. Um, you know, probably not going to make that much money on it now, but somebody else is paying the rent or paying the mortgage, I should say. And I make about $27 a month. So for you cash flow uh, junkies out there, that is like, it's a fantastic investment. So anybody, if you want it, 
It's for sale. You can have it. Twenty seven dollars <laughs> a month. Great IRR. Sure. <laughs> um, but um, that's kind of what really started it. And then in DC, mm-hmm. um, you know, Ryan renovated my my business partner Ryan Gibson renovated mm-hmm. his house. Mm-hmm. I renovated my house. Mm-hmm. On it. Mine was a big renovation. I tore the roof off and added a third floor. Completely demoed all the inside. Added a garage. Mm-hmm. Blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Um, so that kind of really got us started in the DC market with learning contractors, learning permitting and that stuff. Sure. Mm-hmm. And in between our houses, uh, Ryan lived at 1350. I lived at 1354 at 1352 was this really run down, like literally crack house that Ryan and I were in a, in a neighborhood that was kind of turning over. Mm-hmm. And this was one of the last houses on the block that was in really bad shape. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lo and behold, I didn't know it at the time, but I did a direct mail campaign. Um, found the owner, blah, blah, blah. The rest is history. Made a bunch of money on that house. And that's kind of what seeded the company. Did some more single family development, uh, condo conversions, realized that it just wasn't for us. That's just Mm -hmm. not the game we wanted to play in. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. we decided that we did want to be in commercial real estate and we wanted to leverage our development chops plus also get cash flow coming in as well. So sure. mm-hmm. we looked at a bunch of different asset classes, office, all this stuff. And we used the, a version of the military decision-making process that the army has mm-hmm. for making structured decisions in a very complex and ambiguous environment. And for mm-hmm. us at that time, commercial real estate was both complex and ambiguous because we didn't have the experience. Sure. Mm-hmm. So myself being uh, a military planner, an army planner specifically, and then our director of business intelligence, Lindsay, having uh, experience with Special Operations Command and their joint planning process, we were able to teach the rest of our company this process. Mm-hmm. And in there, you have to develop three evaluation criteria to, mm-hmm. or not, not three per se, but we came up with three mm-hmm. to analyze the various courses of action that you want to take against. So ours were easy mm-hmm. to operate, easy to maintain, easy to evict. We call them the three E's internally. Mm -hmm. Um, And those were the three things that we looked at for a commercial asset class. And when we looked across multifamily office, industrial, all this other stuff, Mm -hmm. uh, self storage was the one that fell to the bottom and and rated the highest without any question. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, uh, uh, you know, description there, uh, Scott, I appreciate it. Uh, How did that uh, sort of fascination with self storage, what was it about? Like, I mean, you know, generally, as we know, folks gravitate more towards multifamily and, uh, you know, things like that. Um, what was it about self-storage that was so much appealing? Was there any stats or history? Could you maybe further elaborate on that? Yeah. So up front, I hate people. I don't want to deal with people uh-huh. um, and multifamily. Um, you know, y- yes, you are dealing with people at the self-storage. Sure. With mm-hmm. multifamily, you're dealing with homesteads. Sure. So mm-hmm. I believe that if I make a contract with somebody, I'm going to hold up my bar- my end of the bargain mm-hmm. and you're going to hold up yours. Sure. I don't want a government entity stepping in and allowing somebody else to not uphold their end of the bargain. Mm-hmm. Of course, mm-hmm. there's extenuating circumstances and we want to be as compassionate as we can, but there's also a lot of people that are absolutely taking advantage of the system now sure. and mm-hmm. in the past and in the future. Sure, sure. And mm-hmm. There isn't a government entity out there that gives a damn about grandma's old rocking chair. Mm-hmm. So with self-storage, if you break your contract, then you know you get a right, you get a time, a period to cure. Otherwise, I auction off the unit, sell the sell the belongings and recapture what I can. But more importantly, um, from the time you don't pay it to the time I had my unit in most jurisdictions, it's about 60 days. Mm-hmm. Even in Texas, that like doesn't even care. Like <laughs> you're not going to get your, your apartment back in 60 days. It's probably going to be four months at the, at the earliest. Mm-hmm. And then you're losing six, seven, 1200, $2,500 a month in rent versus our hundred bucks a month rent or whatever it is for a self storage unit. Mm-hmm. So quite frankly, it was just my apathy of dealing with people in homesteads and mm-hmm. um, th- their ability to um, break our contract and financially damage my company. I just wasn't okay with that. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, but was there also any uh, sort of overwhelming stat that uh, maybe tilted you towards self-storage or was it just purely based on uh, people decisions? Uh, I mean, meaning, you know, sort of not allowing the delinquency or the bad debt from people kind of take you down. Was that kind of the central pivot uh, point uh, to be fascinated towards self-storage? Well, so there's also, you know, when you look back at 2008, 2009, and you look at the 
the performance of the various commercial assets. There's only mm -hmm. one that outperformed storage and that was medical office. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, storage did have the lowest um, recapture rate on um, i.e. foreclosures mm -hmm. as any other asset. Um, it's one of those things that does well in good times, it does well in bad times. Sure. Mm -hmm. so even right now across our portfolio, um, our occupancy is, is holding strong, our delinquencies are about where they are normally. So mm -hmm. we aren't seeing much hits. Now we are in secondary and tertiary markets, we're not mm -hmm. in primary markets. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know, as of right now, it might be coming, right? As people, as people start to lose more and more, or if the environment gets that such that we have to shut down again and more and more jobs are hit and, and there's less and less out there, then we, we may feel the pinch as well. But as of right now, you know, we're, we, we're, we're pretty stable. Nice, nice. Thank you for that clarification. Now, Scott, you mentioned, uh, you know, you are into uh, the secondary, the tertiary markets and things like that. Uh, what does that mean uh, from a self storage as a class perspective? Uh, like if we consider, let's say, uh, a downtown or a urban core area, what does that sec secondary tertiary market looks like? Like how many miles apart or uh, are there any other metrics how you go by uh, when you're looking at these sales, uh, you know, secondary tertiary markets? Yeah, it's usually, you know, usually population is one of the main ones. You know, we mm -hmm. are in markets anywhere from 40 to 150,000 people. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The main reason we do that is we stay away from the REITs. Um, there's some big REITs out there. People are familiar with them, public storage, extra space storage. Mm -hmm. Going toe-to-toe going toe -to -toe with those guys are a great way to get punched in the face. They're really good at what they do. They've got a lot of money for marketing, and that's just not a game that we want to play in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we like the smaller, sleepy markets that are outside the main MSAs. There's, there's still good business there. The rents usually aren't as high, um, mm -hmm. and the, but the competition isn't as fierce either. And the sure. jurisdictions are just easier to work with. We are a value add company, which often inc includes expanding of existing facilities mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and building in major MSAs. I mean, good luck building in the downtown Los Angeles. You can do it for <laughs> certain, but there's a certain amount sure. of, of skill and in, in internal connectivity, I will call it, mm -hmm, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the various big cities to get stuff done. And if you don't know how to operate in those big cities, you just get your face punched in. Sure. The smaller jurisdictions usually walk in and I'll, I'll give you an example in Corsicana, Texas, we're building, we're expanding and adding 40,000 square feet. When mm -hmm. I walk into the building department, I walk into the building department, the planning department, the permitting department, all nine yards. And, and the, the three gentlemen that are responsible for the entire process are all sitting there and we just have a chat. I don't need to schedule nine appointments six weeks out. <laughs> you know, all of these guys, And they're super friendly. They're very, very easy to work with. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's a much, much more pleasant experience. When we were doing business in DC, quite frankly, that was a nightmare. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. We got through it and we learned to navigate that system, mm -hmm. but I, it, it's not something I'm interested in doing again. It's just not how I like to do business. I like, I like the easy button. Sure, sure, sure. No, and, and it, tra it translates into, uh, you know, like the sort of the speed and the time of the, your project as well. I mean, it's, it's not that you don't like bureaucracy, but, you know, when you got so many things to do, I mean, you know, sort of the red tape around just the permitting and all the inspections and all that can just absolutely kill uh, the timelines and the cost overruns. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's great to go and walk in a building and talk to three inspectors and, you know, kind of get your things moving on. I mean, that's, that's probably the, uh, the most easiest I have ever heard, I guess. <laughs> it is pretty easy. Now, with the, you know, the, the flip side of that, that edge is that it's easy. So it doesn't take a, a ton of skill set to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. To operate in New York City or Chicago, Los Angeles, DC, mm -hmm. it does take a particular skill set. So it adds a barrier for entry there. Sure. So the mm -hmm. developers that, under, that understand the nuances of getting something done, like California is a fantastic market. Mm -hmm. So if you're plugged into the California market and you understand California laws, you understand permitting, you understand all of the various environmental issues and ecological ecological issues that are over there mm -hmm. and you can navigate those very, very sticky situations, then mm -hmm. you're going to be handsomely rewarded for it. Mm -hmm. The way that we operate, we're headquartered in Colorado and we develop in, you know, a bunch of different places. And right now we just don't have the competencies to go to those big markets, sure. so, which is why we choose the secondary and tertiary markets. Mm -hmm. And it really fits our business plan. And so far we're doing pretty well in, in those markets. And it's just something that you know, we found our niche and we really enjoy those markets. 
Right. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, Scott, uh, what does that value add look like? Um, meaning, uh, you know, obviously in in the multifamily, there are just so much value add, so many amenities and things like that, uh, you know, we can do perhaps maybe reduce the expenses and stuff. But in your asset class of self storage, uh, you know, you are dealing with a smaller box, uh, you know, perhaps a concrete uh, shell all around with, uh, you know, let's say a metal door and things like that. Uh, so could you maybe kind of delve into how you improve and uh, like what, what sort of those value add uh, nature looks like? Yeah, absolutely. I think it'd be, it'd be for the multifamily listeners out there, I, I think we have to talk about maturity of assets first. Mm -hmm. That the, or I should say asset class. Multifamily is an incredibly mature asset class. Mm -hmm. um, there's absolutely innovation going on, but it's not, I, I don't know, and I'm, I'm speaking from a place of ignorance, that it's not necessarily game-changing innovation because sure. it's been going on for a long time. Like people have been living in apartments for quite a while. And sure. yes, the product class is getting better with the various amenities and gyms and, and connect in like the internet of things and all sure. of that. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, and the, 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 the maturity of the management of multifamily has been there for quite some time. Sure. Maturity for storage is recent. It's, it's a, an asset class that was pretty sleepy up until about, I don't know, six years ago at the, at the latest. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very, very mom and pop owned. Mm -hmm. A lot of the facilities that we are purchasing, you can't even pay with a credit card. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in, so when you look at that, just adding that convenience to be able to put it on auto pay for credit card means that somebody doesn't have to either mail a check into the facility or drive down every single month. Mm -hmm. We have residents that live out of state. They, you know, they, they store their belongings and they've moved away or whatever it is. And sure having to mail a check in or, or, you know, not come down there, but even having to remember to mail a check in is kind of a pain in the butt. Sure. sure. Just something as simple as adding um, online payment. Mm -hmm. that, that's a, that's a way to improve our customers' lives. Mm -hmm. um, some of them don't, like I said, don't take credit cards. So in addition to online payments, you can pay with a credit card. You can mm -hmm. book online. There's mm -hmm. different ancillary revenue streams that you can add there. We've added propane to some of our sites. Mm -hmm. We've added online booking, which is, it, it's kind of one of those things that most people are like, really? That, 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 that's a thing? Mm -hmm. And yeah, it is. It's just one of those things that the, the self-storage asset class is, is pretty sleepy. Mm -hmm. um, it's still about 80% mom and pop owned. Wow. With one or two mm -hmm. facilities. Wow. So there's, mm -hmm. there's five REITs, six if you count a new one that just kind of entered the market. But it, it's, not, um, it's not predominantly owned by large players. So when you take over a facility, there's often a number of things that you can do to add amenities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe it's not a playground or a new pool house, but it's it's more convenient of trans transactional convenient type amenities that really sure. kind of drive the value in the in the facility. I see. What about some of the physical improvements, uh, Scott, whether it is, you know, like sort of the, the parking lot or pro sort of, you know, kind of the driveways going up to various units, uh, you know, sort of the physical, whether it is fences or, you know, exterior lighting, things like that. Could you maybe share? Because sometimes, you know, uh, we all have seen mom and pop owners where, mm -hmm. you know, things have been owned for 30, 40 years and they're not in the best and greatest shape. Could you maybe talk about some of the physical improvements if, if there's any? Oh, absolutely. We just bought a facility um, that, that is the spitting image of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Owned for probably 30 or 40 years by, you know, a, a, an old army vet. Uh, we got to talk and it was a good conversation. Sure. Mm -hmm. The facility is nothing, nothing to look at. It's not. And most people would look at it being like, oh, that's a dump. But to <laughs> us, we see like, yeah, that's a dump, but it's, it's, it's pretty easy to get it to where it needs to go. Sure. And it was just like super run down. The sign was old rotted wood. It had an old cedar fence out front that was mm -hmm. not stopping anything, like mm -hmm. anything coming mm -hmm. through there. I mean, an elephant could walk through the holes and get inside the facility. <laughs> Cameras were old and just busted up. The interior lights didn't work. The drive aisles were a mess. Um, there was some broken block around the facility. Mm -hmm. so, you know, for that one, for those physical improvements, we've already replaced the fence. We replaced the sign. We're moving forward with new cameras, new lighting, uh, patching up the drive aisles. Um, we'll start our second phase. We'll be uh, doing a bunch of tuck pointing around, fixing the brick, repainting, and it'll look like a completely different facility. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, we'll probably spend maybe $100,000 or something like that on it mm -hmm. and completely like do a facelift on that facility. It had good bones. It has good customers. 
um, and it's got a good location and the rest is just, you know, uh, probably a little bit more than lipstick, probably some mascara and some, you know, some blush and, and, and for the lady listeners, I'm probably making a complete fool of myself, but, um, but, but definitely, um, uh, a good solid project cause it had really good bones to it. Sure. Sure. Now, Scott, uh, talk about, um, you know, let's say a deal comes to you, right? Uh, what does that analysis look like other than the physical aspects? Uh, can you maybe go through how, what it takes to analyze these deals, whether it's the historicals or perhaps the value add? I mean, all, all of that, can you maybe uh, kind of share how, what does that uh, sort of stat and the analysis uh, looks like? So ours is broken up into really kind of two phases, feasibility mm-hmm. and, and due diligence. Sure. And the reason that Spartan breaks it up that way is we want to be able to answer the question, is our business plan for this property feasible? Sure. Yes mm-hmm. or no. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we usually do, our process is LOI, feasibility study, contract, due diligence, closing. Mm-hmm. The reason we do it that way is because when we write a contract on something, that means we want it. Sure. It doesn't mean, there's a lot of folks out there that are writing contracts that haven't done feasibility. So they don't even know if their plan is feasible or not. Sure, at, sure. At Martin, so, we just, mm-hmm. so I was just going to say that initial uh, feasibility is whether it makes sense to even move forward or not, whether to even go to contract stage. So your LOI is, is as we say, like it's just the intent or the expression of interest yep. uh, with not much capital tied into it. And once feasibility kind of pans out, uh, you kind of move through the contracts and due diligence. So how about this? Let's, let's focus on, as you said, the feasibility part of it, like what it means, you know, what are some of the things you are analyzing during the initial feasibility study? So big one is competitors uh, to understand the demand and supply Mm -hmm. um, so that we understand whether there is a surplus, um, of demand or not. Um, Mm -hmm. can we get in there? Can we expand it? Um, how are there are rental rates compared to the market rental rates? Because mm-hmm. in a value add business plan, there's generally two ways you can expand it or you can increase the rates or both. Sure. So for mm-hmm. us, a lot of times it's both. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of the facilities that we buy, the rate, the, the rental rates are significantly below what is the market rates. Mm-hmm. So we're mm-hmm. able to increase value that way. And then also, you know, we want to be able to expand it if it comes with some additional land. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in addition to the overall market, like understanding like, hey, is this a good market from the various variables that we use to analyze the market? Mm -hmm. Um, Is there demand for it? What's the competitive landscape? But then also Mm -hmm. what is the jurisdictional landscape look like for those uh, jurisdictions that have authority over granting the ability to expand or not? Mm -hmm. So that's all part of the feasibility. and, And when those questions come back, it'll inform us whether it's feasible or not. Mm-hmm. There is also an initial underwriting on the financial side of the house that goes into play. And we've got like tons of variables that go into that. And we have some standards heuristics if we don't necessarily have all of the rent rolls and everything else so that we can make some assumptions uh, during the feasibility stage. Mm-hmm. And as long as those assumptions are validated during the due diligence phase, then we're good to go. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's really what we're looking at from feasibility. I see. Now, in that, uh, Scott, uh, how about, um, you know, some of the metrics that come into it? Like, for example, how many square foot uh, should be available for that uh, sort of size of population uh, within, uh, you know, that city or perhaps uh, whatever mile range that you perhaps target? Uh, Can you maybe talk about some of that supply demand uh, sort of uh, factors as well? Yes, there's something called a saturation rate in storage. Mm -hmm. And it varies all over the place. There is a a US heuristic, but it's not really helpful to use when you start to look at micro markets because generally the self storage almanac does contain uh, rates for uh, smaller markets than a national market. Like a state Mm -hmm. has one and then even within that state, various MSAs will have their own. So it's, it's prudent to use you know, at the highest level, the state level one, if you can't get to um, a market that has a a saturation number, but even that saturation number, it's more of an art than a science Mm -hmm. uh, because all that does is measure equilibrium. It doesn't necessarily measure demand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even when you go through and you calculate whether you have um, an over or under supply, you still have to be a little bit careful 
mm -hmm. uh, that you just don't move forward on a quantitative look, that there's also a qualitative look as well. And that's calling all of your competitors and assessing where they're there at as far as where they are at for market rates and then also where they're at for occupancy. Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy to find that stuff out um, mm -hmm. once you get a process down and you get used to calling the competitors mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. really kind of verifying qualitatively what you're seeing quantitatively from the metrics. Mm -hmm. Now, Scott, what does that look like? Uh, meaning, you know, when you're calling the competitors, I mean, uh, I mean, are you like calling that, hey, John, I'm looking for, uh, you know, like a, I don't know, like a four by eight pad. How many do you have? What, what, what does that script look like? I'm kind of curious because uh, to know, because I'm, you know, if I'm tr imagining myself trying to find the information from a, uh, from a competitor, you know, I guess uh, we call it like walking your comps in the multifamily world, right? Uh, so, I mean, I can see myself going into apartments and, you know, understanding what they have done, what they're charging for rent. But for, for a uh, self-storage facility, what does that look like? Like, how are you doing that? Same way as any other asset class would. Mm -hmm. Some of us, some of us call in and secret shop. I don't, that's not my personality. I walk in and said, yeah. I'm buying the place down the road and I want to understand demand. Mm -hmm. Some, some managers will just kick you out of the store. Some will just be like, Oh yeah, come on in. And they'll talk to you about it because it's sure mm -hmm. you, you can't really stop it. Like they can't stop it from happening. So sure. you know, what, they, what they don't want, you know, the, the, the smarter managers and smarter owners will know that they can't stop the transaction. So it, it's, it's probably better to play ball with somebody coming in than it is to try to hide it because if they come in and do something stupid, all of you will get hurt. So if there's absolutely no demand in the market and your facility is 70% full, it does not behoove you to tell them that it's 95% full because when they come in and add more so, like supply, mm -hmm. that 70% is going to drop down to 60 or 55. So mm -hmm. it's very similar. Like, you know, for this, we're, we're, we're currently purchasing a four property portfolio in Texas. Mm -hmm. And um, we did a, a feasibility slash due diligence trip. We combined them because of COVID and we actually drove down there in an RV mm -hmm. to be safe. And uh, we went into, I don't know, 35 or 40 competitors over a, a three day period, maybe even more, maybe like 50 in, mm -hmm. in two different markets that we were down there. And we just told them what was going on. And, and a lot of them were, were, I'd say overwhelmingly, probably 90% of them were, were very open to kind of talk to us about it and let us know what's going on. A couple were like, oh, I can't talk to you. You got to talk to the owner, blah, 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 that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So mm -hmm. it's not perfect. It's, it's, it's like I said, like demand, it's an art, more of a science. Mm -hmm. So now uh, for the competitors, uh, Scott, uh, are you also looking at what their facility looks like and what is your vision for, uh, you know, something that you are going to possibly take over? Could you maybe describe some of the, uh, so as you walk into your, let's say, uh, you know, few of the competitive facilities, what, what are you looking on the on the ground as you're walking, saying that okay, my uh, sort of my prospect uh, purchase is uh, looking something like this, but now as I'm walking to my comps, uh, what are the things you are looking for? What things you like, you don't like, and oh, could you maybe describe, uh, uh, sort of, you know, from a physical standpoint, I guess. Yeah, certainly. So definitely the security of the facility, that's probably the number one thing mm -hmm. is, is it properly secured? Can you see cameras? Is, does the, is the fence actually doing its job or is it run down and broken open? Mm -hmm. um, are, are, are the keypads easily accessible for people to punch them in without getting, at, like getting off their car or getting out of their car? Mm -hmm. And then just when you walk in the office, what's the general feel? Um, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the facilities we're buying now, when you walk into the office, it was not a very pleasant uh, smell or sight when you walked in the office. And to us, mm. that's a value add opportunity. We can, sure. you know, take that office and make it more friendly to the customer. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, that's really what we look for. And then also curb appeal, like, sure, does sure. it look nice? Does somebody pull in and they get a warm and fuzzy for wanting to put their belongings there? Mm -hmm. You know, while, while everybody, you know, kind of jokes about people storing junk and storage, um, they're, they're valuable to somebody. We all, you know, we all value different things that whole, sure. Sure. Uh, loss aversion um, that people really value their stuff. And if it's theirs, it's much more valuable to them than it is to you. So we want to make sure that they have a safe, secure and dry kind of place to make sure that they, they can maintain their belongings and, mm -hmm. and be protected. In addition to having a good experience and having managers that can help them solve their problems and 
you know, some, some minor products uh, that you would use in a, in a regular kind of storage transaction, packaging tape, boxes, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. And now moving on to uh, sort of the due diligence side of these things, Scott, uh, what does that look like? What things you are looking, are you looking at the books or, or could you maybe walk us down into some of the details of due diligence? Yeah, we have, we actually have a due diligence tracker that's 675 items long. <laughs> um, that, that, that we go through for every single facility we do. And it, it ranges everything from title, survey, permitting, zoning, um, sure. all the way down to financial, admin, legal, human resources, mm -hmm. uh, your, your pretty standard stuff. Mm -hmm. Storage doesn't really, um, th there's nothing really different about uh, a self-storage mm -hmm. than a multifamily. You don't necessarily have to go and look in every single unit because the probability of a gotcha inside of a self storage unit versus an apartment is, is very, very low. Sure. Um, you do want to do uh, storage. You want to do audits to make sure that the, that the rent rolls actually match what's happening out there on the facility, but you don't necessarily have to open every single door. Mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. fact, it's, it'd be very, very arduous to do that. Um, <clears throat> so the, the due diligence for a storage, like any other real estate uh, mm -hmm. commercial asset class, uh, is pretty exhaustive everywhere from, you know, the, the, the paperwork dance to the actual site inspection to make sure that you, you know, you're not, there's, again, there's no real big gotchas in storage other than maybe sure. drainage. That's probably the only real big gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, if you're buying a normal storage facility, some of the new big ones with elevators and large HVACs or conversions for old department stores have some more things that you got to really pay attention to, but it's pretty straightforward. It's just, you know, for, for, for Spartan, it's very exhaustive. I see. I see. No, and, and thank you for sharing that. I mean, I can see uh, what you're saying there, Scott, is that, I mean, from a physical due diligence perspective, we know how intensive the multifamily in general is. You're looking at, you know, the HVAC, the plumbing, the roof, and I mean, the list is endless, but perhaps for self-storage, it's, it's far more simplistic and straightforward. That, that's, uh, that's, you know, that seems pretty obvious there. Uh, now start talking about value add and some of the things that you were saying that, you know, hey, the office is messed up or perhaps the leasing office does not look, uh, uh, you know, that great and things like that. Um, I imagine, you know, a lot of those things are not that costly to uh, fix up. Maybe perhaps it's just a nice paint job, perhaps a lot of decluttering and reorganizing in an office, maybe exterior wise, uh, maybe it is like painting it nicely, maybe having some uh, flower beds or mulching, things like that, just to make it look appealing and things like that. Uh, am I understanding it right? Or are there any more elements uh, that you can add as far as how you do that exterior interior value add uh, as well when you're in sort of taking over and what does that initial uh, takeover period look like you nailed it, it it's it's there's nothing generally mm -hmm. there's nothing that's major that's going on the only <laughs> major project that we execute is a door swap out so self storage kind of the old school on um, maybe generation 1 that was built in the 70s 80s that kind of stuff had swing doors, um, not ideal by any means. You got to worry about wind and it's, you got two doors that you have to prop open. It's just not ideal from a customer experience. Mm -hmm. So we have one facility that we have to swap out 343 swing doors with roll up doors. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's not a difficult um, project, but mm -hmm. it is, it is, I'll say it's not difficult in execution. It's difficult in coordination mm -hmm. because you have with all of your customers to get access to those units and then um, make sure that the doors get installed and secured in the same day because you can't mm -hmm. leave people stuff mm -hmm. on, on secure. But generally the value add is just very, very, very simple rinse and repeat drop in. Um, there can be a lot of projects, but they're generally pretty small. Sure, sure, sure. Now, uh, a sort of a contrasting question now, uh, Scott, is that um, sometimes what looks easy is also gets pretty competitive. And what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, there is not of uh, not a lot of, uh, you know, sort of bells and whistles that you can sort of toggle within self storage, right? So are you seeing increased competition uh, in self storage? Uh, and perhaps a lot of uh, you know, companies are jumping in. Could you maybe describe that competitive landscape, how it looks like right now? We, we definitely are. Um, 
we weren't the only ones that noticed that 08, 09 self storage did pretty good. A lot of private equity, a lot of New York and East Coast money and West Coast money that's been pouring into storage over the last like three or four years. Mm -hmm. Pressed cap rates, it's made it just more competitive across the board. Mm -hmm. I think that's just the nature of, you know, when, when something performs really well, it, get, it, it grabs attention. Sure. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, like that increased competition, you know, I mean, it helps weed out the, the weaker parts of that so that you kind of get rid of that, that, you know, entry level operator that can't necessarily play in that. So sure. when you're, when you're a, a kind of a, a systematic uh, buyer like us mm -hmm. and brokers get to know your process and they know that you're very process oriented and they know that if you go to contract, um, there's a, you know, right now we're at a hundred percent contract to close. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The reason is not, not because we're buying bad deals or because we're trying to like prop up a metric. It's because during feasibility, we shake out all of the potential problems mm -hmm. so that when we get to contract, as long as what's been presented to us is what is actually in reality, mm -hmm. we're good to go. It's mm -hmm. our, it's our belief that we don't, we don't want to retrade if we don't have to. Sure. Mm -hmm. As long as again, what's presented to us is, is what is we close. Sure. So we've got a couple of brokers that really know that about us and they know mm -hmm. that we're systematic they know our process they know exactly what we're going to do there's no surprises there's no emotion there's none of this shenanigans that sure a lot of goes on during the um the buying selling transaction sure so you know with that like sometimes increased competition if it's competition that is it as good as you you look much better comparatively across the board so mm -hmm. bring it on Awesome. Awesome. And I can see the disciplinarian uh, army mindset that you approach this. I mean, it's, it's very evident. So, you know, I couldn't, you know, help but notice that, you know, that's incredible. Uh, now, Scott, uh, talking about, let's say, you know, when you're looking at a project, right, uh, to acquire, uh, what is the, the, that sort of the secret that gets you excited? Uh, you mentioned that ability to expand and add additional uh, sort of uh, storage units to the facility. Is that kind of the secret X uh, in all of this? Uh, because, you know, I imagine that, let's say, that secret is not there and you have a plain vanilla deal wherein you're saying that, uh, okay, you know, we're buying it at X and we have, you know, the normal sort of the operational efficiencies, uh, things to do. Uh, could you maybe share with us that, okay, what does that look like? I mean, um, I hope I'm getting the question right in terms of, sure. uh, you know, what, what are those, some of the secret things that you're looking for to kind of get that upside? There's really no secret. There's a couple of ways to do it. You can, you know, really be able to increase the street rates. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't get us all that excited mm -hmm. um, because the market can change. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and prevent you from executing that business plan. So that mm -hmm. alone doesn't necessarily get us excited. Sure. When, you know, really what gets us excited is, is the ability to expand mm -hmm. um, in addition and coupled with the ability to raise rates um, mm -hmm. and like facilities that are just in good locations with good solid bones mm -hmm. that need our general uh, refresh package to drop in both from the capital project side and the operational uh, improvement side. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that leads into, uh, Scott, the question is that uh, perhaps you're looking at the lot size and what's, uh, what's there currently on the uh, sort of on the ground physically, and also perhaps checking into, per, I guess, planning and zoning in this uh, situation that, hey, I mean, let's say if the I mean, I'm just making this up uh, is that, the uh, you know, let's say the uh, lot size is four acres, but right now you only have 200 uh, units and there is an ability to perhaps add another additional, I don't know, maybe 70 units or something like that. So that uh, that uh, sort of the feasibility or the due diligence uh, uh, and checking into planning and zoning, is that also one of the like may, a very key step that you look for? It, 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 for an expansion play, it is the key step. Mm -hmm. we, we have rezoned in the past, mm -hmm. um, but it's really a big pain in the butt. Anybody that's gone through a rezone, like, mm -hmm. hey, it's a pain in the butt and it's super risky. You're at, when you're, when you're doing something outside of the written code, you're at the mercy of the jurisdiction. Sure, you sure. You're on the wrong side of the wrong bureaucrat and you can go sideways real fast. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You can be pressured into doing things you don't really want to do that's mm -hmm. not in the best interest of your project. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you do them because it's, it makes sense and the project's still a really good project. But mm-hmm. when you are adhering to the code and you have a matter of right project, it is very, very difficult for any uh, uh, jurisdiction to uh, go outside that code. And if there is, there's legal recourse um, if they do. So that's really kind of, I guess, you know, you ask about the exciting thing, uh, getting a piece of dirt that's already zoned and matter of right for storage um, that we can just easily, don't have to worry about the kind of the horizontal development. We can just get it. It's already entitled because it's matter of right. We can just submit plan, a site plan and building permits and, and go from there. Sure. That's really, that's what really makes it pleasant. Mm-hmm. And are there a lot of opportunities that you notice like that? Because I imagine that, let's say, if the storage industry is as competitive as it is, is it a common place to find that, hey, there is, you know, so much meat on the bone that just left uh, and, and perhaps that may be a hallmark sign of uh, mom and pop operator not doing what they should have been, you know, sort of doing and capitalizing on the uh, sort of the upside or the opportunities that the existing asset may have presented them? No, there's not at all. It's why Spartan only buys like two or three deals a year, just because mm-hmm. there's just there's just not that many like really smoking deals out there right now. Like you said, it's competitive, mm-hmm. uh, and it's and it's really like there's only so many things you can do to create value here. So yeah, sure. there's, just not, there's not a lot of deals out there. Right, 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 right. Got it, got it. Now uh, let's say if the new uh, uh, sort of the new uh, unit addition expansion play is not there. Uh, but, you know, you're talking about a plain, uh, plain, plain vanilla value add type of deal. How much of a uh, upside you're looking for? Is it like 15, 20% uh, raise that you're looking for to make it a viable project for you? What does that delta look like? For the most part, I, I can't, it, it's hard for me to answer that because that's not a deal we put, that we, that's a deal we probably pass on. I see. <laughs> that 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 was I, I I guess that was also one of the things I was looking for that you know which are some of the deals that you pretty much pass on. <laughs> now moving on uh, Scott uh, and talking about uh, property management. Uh, what is uh, what does that look like? Um, I mean are you managing it in house or are you hiring um, you know different players and uh, companies uh, sort of uh, in various uh, cities where you have your asset? How does that look like? So we do both. Um, the one that we have a third party manager on, it was uh, forced on us by our lender, but major- the majority of it is, ran- is, is ran by our operations team. Mm-hmm. We have a corporate property manager. We have a real estate uh, administrative assistant. We have a director of operations, and then we have facility staff. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also, we also have a marketing associate, and then we have a bookkeeper um, inside of our corporate headquarters that all support, or all support our property management operations. So for the, for the vast majority of the time, we like doing them in house, um, but occasionally we do have to use third party management as required by the lender. I see. Now, what does that look like? Let's say if we are imagining a uh, 250 to a 400 uh, a, a unit uh, a, you know, storage facility, um, are we talking one person, two person? How, how does that uh, uh, look like? Well, the facility we're talking about is 1,106 units. Um, so that one is 4% of revenue plus some other fees here and there. Mm-hmm. And, 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 uh, just sort of payroll wise, uh, and things like that, like how much do you budget for payroll or, uh, I mean, are there any like big expenses, uh, typically in a property management of a self storage that, uh, uh, we should know. Payrolls, your, your big one, property taxes is another one, not, not much different than a multifamily. It's, it's very, very similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, our marketing and advertising budgets probably a little bit more. Um, mm-hmm. Again, I don't know. I don't know the performance for market for multifamily. Sure, I think a little bit different is multifamily. You 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 turn over an apartment, you know, once a year in theory, hopefully, mm-hmm. um, you know, at the at the at the soonest if mm-hmm. you don't have multi-year leases. For us, we have people come in for a month, so we can turn the same unit over twelve times in a year. So a little bit more marketing intensive on our side of the house, I think, mm-hmm. um, than, than multifamily. Um, so probably a little bit bigger budgets for marketing and advertising. I see. I see. And, and for, lease up, but probably afterwards for sure. 
Sure, sure, sure. And, and talking about like, let's say the culture of the staff and things like that, like, you know, or maybe perhaps some of the systems, whether it's telephone systems or, you know, uh, voicemails, uh, or, you know, if you're using any of the email and websites and things like that, can you maybe share some of those uh, sort of the system related things uh, around the property management side, like how you tackle that or what, what are your favorite things that you would like to see it implemented as you take over some of the new assets? Sure. I, I can't dive deep because it's not what I do inside the company. Sure. So that would be our director of operations to actually talk about the nuances of the various systems. Mm -hmm. One of the things holistically is we want to make sure that we have a good customer experience. It should be sure. effective and like it should be an emotional experience where there's a connection to the facility. And we have that. We're working on it. We're not, we're not definitely not to where we need to be, but we're, we're making great strides towards that. Some of our managers are fantastic with that. Mm -hmm. And, other ones are getting trained up on it right now. I see. And what is your exit strategy, Scott? Is it the place to maybe have a whole lot of them and sell it to a REIT or what does that look like? We have multiple exit strategies for each one of our facilities. Mm -hmm. um, we have a saying that when opportunity knocks, you want to, you want to answer the door. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is to have multiple doors for opportunity to knock on. So <laughs> the one of a, a course of action that we do have is to combine everything into a large portfolio and then sell it off to a REIT or private equity group. Mm -hmm. uh, we would sell individual facilities off. Like once the business plan is completed, mm -hmm. um, some of them may be recapped with a refinance and where um, investors are made whole or new investors are brought in pretty, pretty standard practices across the industry. Sure, sure. And uh, let's talk about sort of the investor and the investor relations side of the house, uh, Scott. Um, how are your deals structured uh, from a uh, general partnership and uh, passive uh, limited uh, investors perspective? They're all different because we do deal by deal. Sure. Uh, but generally there's a pref and then a waterfall split. We try to keep it simple. Sure. Um, we have, a say, we have a say, another saying, a confused mind says no. So we don't have complex waterfalls. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. We do not do return of capital. We do return on capital. So we do not liquidate capital accounts mm -hmm. during the project unless there's some sort of liquidity event mm -hmm. outside of operating returns for the facility, mm -hmm. which I, that's probably the only thing that maybe makes us a little bit different than some of the, some of the multifamily uh, syndicators out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally... That, that's kind of what we do. We do have B offerings, so I don't necessarily put out on, on kind of general areas what our returns are or what our splits are, but it, it's pretty in line with what the market's doing. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, clarification there, Scott. Now, talking about the competition and, uh, you know, how you are kind of uh, adjusting with respect to that, like, I mean, as you, as we alluded on, on the earlier part of the show, Scott, that you have the Wall Street players coming in. Uh, so how, how do you sort of block and tackle around uh, some of that uh, big uh, sort of the equity and the big money that they can bring in? Stay off the field. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean that honestly, like that's why we're not in the top 50 MSAs mm -hmm. because generally the coastal money looks at top 50 MSAs. They're not necessarily looking at secondary and tertiary MSAs yet. Mm -hmm. They're starting to look there because that's where the yield is. Sure. So that's why we decided, like we decided very early on to not get on the field. Mm -hmm. um, I'm five foot eight, 164 pounds. I'm not getting on a pro football field. It would end incredibly badly for me. Sure. Um, Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's one of the things about Spartan is understanding our limitations and mm -hmm. um, exercising those limitations inside of an environment in which we can win, not necessarily um, letting our egos get the best of you and going to play in a market where you get your head punched in. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, now, talking about the data and sort of the all the different things that you look to, uh, you know, analyze some of the newer deals and offerings and things like that. Can you maybe share what does that look like? Is it just pure broker relations or is it, uh, you know, some of the external websites? Could, could you maybe share some of that detail, Scott? We have an entire business intelligence uh, team inside of Spartan, and we spend about $60,000 a year on data. Now, for a small team, that's a lot. Uh, sure. Big team, not so much, but small team, yeah, very much so. Sure. Uh, sure. There's a, a multitude of data sources that we use. And again, you know, like the operation side of the house, I have a director of business intelligence that could geek out on that all day long and, and talk to you about all the different data sets. But um, I know some of them, but, but not enough to, to really go deep in it. 
I see. I see. So basically that also kind of comes down to, um, you know, what the sort of the supply demand trends are, how much is the, uh, you know, sort of the per square foot occupancy and things like that. Is that kind of all, all of that in depth, I guess? Uh, but also a lot of other things. We have a boat storage. So the boat permit registration was data that we pulled mm -hmm. because it was very, very, very difficult to understand the feasibility for, or I should say the demand for boat storage. Like how do you assess that? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the ways that we did was our business intelligence team pulled the number of permits that had been uh, applied for in kind of a, a local market area of where this facility was located over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. So we saw there was like a 600% increase over the last three years in boat registrations. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. if you're registering a boat, probably means you have a boat, I'm guessing, like sure, sure. <laughs> probably extrapolate that. And there's a good chance that you may require storage. Um, sure. Not guaranteed by any means, but mm -hmm. there's a deep chance that you would. And the way that we looked at it, there's 204 units there. We only have to convince 204 boat owners that it's a good idea to place their boat at our facility. So um, that one's in lease up. We took it over as a hot mess. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's leasing up ahead of schedule and we're doing pretty well. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Now talking about some of the RV parks that uh, you own as well, uh, Scott, what does that uh, side of the business look like? It, it, it's very similar to storage. Um, mm -hmm. That was one of the reasons why we did it. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at easy to operate, easy to maintain, um, it's pretty easy. Like we're only responsible for kind of the, the uh, below ground systems. There's nothing that we're responsible for, for the RVs. Mm -hmm. We got a really good opportunity to purchase them. Uh, they're in West Texas in the Permian, mm -hmm. uh, where it's oil central. So one of them is, is doing okay. The other one, not so well, but we planned for that. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things from our business intelligence side of the house is they assess it like, hey, this is an oil. This is going to boom and bust. So we better, mm -hmm. um, hey, finance, you better underwrite this to where it can survive some booms and busts. Mm -hmm. So we bought one of our parks where break-even occupancy of the park is 34%. Wow. So, mm -hmm. um, and the other park we bought with cash, so there's no debt. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we did the risk assessment there and we, and we executed those deals with the correct mitigation measure, measures such that we wouldn't be in a problem when oil was doing one of these numbers, which is what we're seeing today. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Now it's very hard to plan for, uh, like an oil price war, a, a virus and all this other stuff that's going on. It's almost impossible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nobody ever in their wildest dreams predicted oil would be negative $40 a barrel. Nobody ever, ever. Uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, we are absolutely talking about the pandemic all day long, but yep. even before that kind of onset itself, right. I mean, oil, I mean, the oil price war was already going on. And I mean, we were all looking at the oil, uh, sort of the oil, the struggles with, with the oil and here comes the pandemic. So it's, uh, I mean, 2020 has been quite a uh, one, two, three punch and they, they just keep coming, you know? You can sprinkle on a tornado at one of our parks just to make things interesting. So wow. <laughs> yeah. I, can, I can relate to that. Now, one last question, Scott. Um, how about the financing side of the house as far as uh, storages go? Like, uh, is that bank? Is that Fannie, Freddie? How, how does that look like? It's not Fannie and Freddie. There's no, there's no financing available that way. Mm -hmm. um, but bank, there's life insurance money, there's CMBS stuff. So many of your standards um, financing conduits are there mm -hmm. um, with the exception of government backed loans. SBA is there. Sure. Um, if you're a smaller operator, there are some SBA options, but Fannie, Freddie, they're not. Awesome. Awesome. Now, one last question, Scott. Um, what is your best piece of advice for newer investors who are looking to kind of, uh, you know, uh, understand this field better and, uh, you know, perhaps uh, start looking into purchasing? What, what are some of the best pieces of advice you can share to, to newer investors looking at this? So I hear this a lot of ready, fire, aim. Mm -hmm. um, and my, I personally think that's the worst advice on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, that's certainly not how we're taught to shoot in the military and, mm -hmm. and we're the best at that. So um, I'm going to say ready, aim, fire. Sure. However, put a time limit on your aiming. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for new investors, we took 90 days out there to learn as much as we could about self-storage, mm -hmm. but we identified that self-storage was our asset class. So for new investors out there, 
the first thing that you should do is figure out what you, what you think is really important. What do you value? Don't invest in storage if you think, if you're a minimalist life person, because it, it's gonna run counter to your values. Don't invest in multifamily if you're not okay with evicting people and throwing them out on the street. Sure. Because you will have to do that. And maybe, maybe you don't have to do it personally, but if you're an investor in that, you have a hand in that. Right. Mm -hmm. Really like understand your values and then overlay those with whatever asset class you want to invest in. And then take 90 days and learn about it. Don't just jump in. Don't ready fire aim. That's a great way to just light $50,000 on fire or whatever it is. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Don't do that. Like read and read and read, but also don't get stuck by analysis paralysis. There's a balance there. And I think 90 days, if you're diligent about it for those 90 days, um, about the, the learning and the education piece of it, you can get what you need to know to make a safe investment. Incredible insight. Thank you, uh, Scott. It's been a pleasure. Uh, please share with the listeners how they can find you and learn more about uh, you and your company. Yeah, I'm, I, I can be reached at scott at spartan-investors.com. For anybody that's interested in investing, just jump to our website, www.spartan-investors.com. Incredible. Thank you so much, uh, Scott, for viewers and listeners of the podcast. Uh, also, we are also at premiumcashflow.com. Uh, we also have articles, uh, stats, and obviously the podcast where you know esteemed guests like scott regularly are there we also have incredible opportunities uh, for investments from time to time so if you are uh, someone who who is listening and interested and curious about some of the asset classes we deal in kindly uh, register yourself and schedule a call with us uh, we continually learn and share advice from obvious guests like uh, Scott. Uh, so we know what's shaking and what's happening uh, right today and the market. And there are still the opportunities still keep coming. So it is a great time to be out there. So thank you for coming on, uh, Scott. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, I'm uh, honored that you took time today to come on and uh, hopefully we can reconnect also in future and learn more about, uh, you know, different things that are happening with your group. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. I hope I've added value to your listeners. Incredible. You did. You did. You absolutely did. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for listening to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at premiumcashflow.com to sign up for weekly updates, research articles, and more. We will see you again for another great interview with an expert guest.